Okay, here we go. My name is Barbara Gervasi, and I am the founder and the executive director of the Kyle Highland Foundation for Teen Support. And we have a teen center here in Venetia that we established um, and we continue to maintain and hope to open very soon. Um, I have with me here tonight, Jamie Eels Booth from Solano Pride and Melina Osmondson from the Venetia Teen Center and the Kyle Highland Foundation. And they will be speaking tonight on gender revolution, gender equality, and the LGBTQIA plus community. So without further ado, why don't we just go ahead and get started? Okay, well, welcome back everyone to the fourth evening of the Kyle Highland Foundation's campaign focusing on gender equality. My name, as Barb said, is Jamie Eels Booth, and I'm the Youth Services Coordinator at Solano Pride. And part of my job at Solano Pride is providing cultural humility training on LGBT community to educators, administrators, and other LGBT youth serving professionals. And what I'm presenting you tonight, ideally, is an eight hour training with four hours the first day and then four hours the second day with at least a day in between the two with a little anthropological and sociological homework thrown in the mix. It's actually pretty fun. I hope that doesn't dissuade any of you though, or let that dissuade you, but stick with me. Uh, I promise we can get through the important parts and hopefully some Q&A afterwards. Um, tonight's an enormously condensed fashion it's my privilege to talk to you about gender equality and its effects on all LGBTQ people and really all people, regardless of sexual orientation and gender identity, regardless of race and air quote sex or creed. Um, tonight we'll be talking about some commonly used words and phrases surrounding gender equality. We'll talk about some history, some laws that shape our view of gender equality and Ultimately, how everyone has a part to play and everyone plays a part every day, whether they realize it or not. And helping me do this tonight is my wonderful co-host, whom I'll let introduce themselves. Take it away. Oh, hi, I'm Alina. Um, as Barb said, I'm part of the um, Kyle Highland Foundation from the Benicia Teen Center. Um, Basically, I'm basically just the right-hand man to Jamie tonight, so yeah, I'm not sure what else to add. Well, I, I could add on for you, but we don't have that long. <laughs> I'm your biggest fan, not really. That's kind of creepy and stalkery. <laughs> I'm a fan of Milena for sure. I so, appreciate the support very much. <laughs> <laughs> so here we go. Well, you all, I thought I was going, there we go. <laughs> Before we begin though, I thought I'd share a story that will kind of set the context for tonight's discussion. Um, when we all began to plan our gender equality campaign, I happened to be telling a friend about things I had going on this month. And when I mentioned I planned to discuss gender equality in the context of the LGBT community, she said she was confused. I should probably also tell you that she identifies as a cisgendered lesbian feminist and is a professor at Women's Studies and Communication. And if you all just shut down after that, stick with me. Um, so I asked her what was making her confused and I immediately started talking to her about gender equality issues and gender roles, inequities and inequalities, kind of like what I'm gonna do tonight. And she said, yeah, yeah, I get that part, but I don't understand why you are going to be talking about feminism and feminist issues. Then she said to me, you're not a lesbian or a trans woman and don't identify as a woman. Don't you think the audience will find it strange if a person that looks and sounds like you is giving a talk on gender equality, especially since you're non-binary? Again, stick with me. And that's when I realized that even with my own LGBT community, even among the learned and loving, there are huge populations of people that associate gender equality with feminist movements and women's rights. 
and rightly so. Some people rightly associate gender equality with women's ongoing struggles for equality and equity, including voting rights, equal economic opportunities, education equity, reproductive rights, the list goes on and on. A look back in our own country's history shows that women have made great strides in the fight for equality and equity. Dr. Cervantes and our other presenters mentioned a, a few this week. Abigail Adams' 1776 letter to her husband, President John Quincy Adams, to remember the ladies. The first women's right convention of 1848, the suffrage movement beginning in 1889, ratification of the 19th Amendment in 1920, Rosa Parks' civil rights and equal pay in 55, the birth control pill in 1960, Equal Pay Act of 61, Title VII of the Civil Rights Act in 64, Title IX in 1972, Roe versus Wade in 73, the Violence Against Women's Act of 1994, finally, all the way to present day and Kamala Harris being sworn in as the first woman and first woman of color vice president of the United States. Let's all take a moment and let that sit. But when we discuss gender equality solely through the lens of feminist movements and women's rights, we discount millions of others, including LGBT people, and not just our lesbian and trans women friends, but all those who don't identify as women and who are still affected every day of their life by gender roles and gender equality. Or in most cases, I guess, gender inequality and sex gender discrimination. In order to talk about gender equality within the LGBT community or any other community for that matter, we're going to have to look at gender inequality and gender sex discrimination and their many guises. And in order to do that, it's helpful if we understand the rhetoric surrounding gender and gender equality and its definition as a whole, or at least one of its many variants. The gender inequity index that you see on the left, I hope it's your left, was developed by the United Nations Development Program, the UNDP, in I think the early 90s to quantify the loss of achievement within a, a country due to gender inequality. What the United Nations learned when aggregating their findings is that in order to illustrate gender inequality on a global level, they had to start considering each country and their views on gender and gender roles and gender identities and sexual orientation and gender expression, all while researching the laws, social beliefs and customs of each individual country. And so the World Health Organization came to an agreement after about 20 years and counting worth of research that they would define gender as what you see on the right. Hopefully it's your right. What the World Health Organization began to realize over time is that everyone everywhere is gendered and almost everyone everywhere is negatively affected by the sex gender system. Gender roles and gender stereotypes, especially LGBT people, in every country they looked at. Everyone. In this country and many others, laws that protect people who prescribe to their gender role often do not protect those that are gender nonconforming or don't prescribe to their gender roles. And I know many of you are probably saying, Jamie, I get the gender stuff, but what does sexual orientation have to do with gender equality? or at least that's what my friend wanted to know. And so I told her over the past 20 years, hundreds of studies have shown the ways in which sexuality, including same-sex sexuality, is both deeply concerned with and shaped by gender. For the most part, for gender theorists anyway, this fact clarifies the goals of feminism and many gender equality activists and feminists, including sexuality and same-sex sexuality, is ultimately the only way to achieve equality for all people on a global level. As the definition of gender points out, gender is a social construct. 
And when it's studied, it's studied as a gender system. In this country and every country around the globe, gender and gender roles are defined by a particular culture's beliefs, their mores and the environment. And there are many laws in place in most countries that give people based on their gender, the rights they either enjoy or do not enjoy as a part of that culture. In our law, the phrase gender discrimination is usually contextualized as sex discrimination and as most people probably know, some countries have very rigid and sometimes polarizing views surrounding what sex means and whether or not it's separate from gender. How that culture's definition of gender trickles down into its laws that currently exist or don't exist are more than likely based on a cultural bias. Its social norms and our social norms determine what's legal and what's illegal how a person should or shouldn't act, what a person should wear or shouldn't wear, and even what a person should be or could be. And a lot of it depends on the gender sex they were assigned at birth. And ultimately, and perhaps most frustrating, success at reaching our goals is largely determined by the society in which we live. And this is often bad news for us LGBT folks. So knowing this, and in an effort to research gender equality, one that includes LGBT people on a global level, the World Health Organization began using a phrase that most people here might recognize. It's pronounced soji, and no, it's not referring to a rice paper uh, room divider. It's an abbreviation combining sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. It's a complex term and one that deals with subjects considered taboo in many cultures to be sure, even our own. But it's one of the main reference terms used to describe the LGBT community. And it's being introduced in many legal doctrines throughout our country in the United Nations documents, obviously, and has become increasingly used in our healthcare systems, our education systems, community access systems, and social media. We use rudimentary methods and almost kindergarten level illustrations like the genderbred person, gender unicorn, genderbred, and the soji spectrum that you see here to intentionally ask people to step outside of their binaries. You see its usefulness lies in its inclusiveness and it refers to characteristics common to all human beings. Everyone has a sexual orientation and everyone has a gender identity and everyone also expresses their gender, not just LGBT people. Now the question is, who gets to decide for you? Does anyone or anyone else or anything else play a part in your soji? That's a rhetorical question because the answer will always be yes, until that is maybe we colonize Mars and start from scratch and you know, I won't be there and I, I'm kidding. Well, I'm kidding, not kidding. Um, we all know that rigid beliefs on sex and gender put people in boxes or closets if you like, but these beliefs don't reflect realities on human sexuality, especially how gender roles and expressions, sexual attraction and sexual behavior influence how a person views or lives their own sexuality. These notions always favor male-female distinctions and are biased against those who don't fit existing stereotypes on sex or gender. However, as I'm sure we can all agree, Diversity is a natural characteristic of human sexuality. In reality, sexual attraction can and do happen between people of the same or opposite genders, and we do not always fit in the gender roles and identities expected of us. The problem is, from the moment a person is born, other people and systems are playing a role in everyone's soji, just by mere classification based on genitalia and we call it sex. The fact that we all have a sex though, isn't the problem. Some of us have more than one sex. The problem is the fact that most cultures set parameters by the gender roles that are assigned based on that person's sex 
regardless of how we feel about it. So if you agree that social norms are the implicit, formal, or informal rules that most people accept and abide by, and if you agree social norms are influenced by belief systems, the economic context, and sometimes by perceived rewards or sanctions for adhering to or not complying with whatever is considered air quote normal, I'm pretty sure by now you can see why LGBT people have, have a stake in gender equality. Social norms are embedded in formal and informal institutions and produced and reproduced through social interaction and reinforced by laws. It's taught to us from almost the time we're born. It might even be innate in humans, who knows? Well, the term gender norms and gender roles is a subset of social norms that describe how people of a particular gender and often age are expected to behave in a given social context. The list you see here isn't exhaustive by any means, but are many traditional gender stereotypes that most of our groups and training participants at least have come up with. And I encourage you in the chat, as Barb said, to throw any, any in you might think of along the way. In fact, I encourage you to comment if a particular notion that we discussed today moves you to speak out in any way. The fact is, gender norms often reinforce inequalities between genders and tightly constrain actions and behaviors. Gender norms are usually thought of in terms of male and female or masculine and feminine binaries, and that leaves out a whole lot of people. Many scientific entities, including the World Health Organization, explore the ways in which gender norms can be and are harmful and discriminatory and how they can be changed. You'll often hear this referred to as the social norm theory. And the social norm theory just helps explain why people behave in the ways they do and puts the focus on communities and the interplay between community level and individual behavior. It's kind of like the idea that we're the product of our environments. Social norms are always thought of in terms of group dynamics or community beliefs, including beliefs that what others in a community expect a person to do. Like we all stop at red lights. Do we have to stop at red lights? Everyone expects us to stop at red lights. And it's for this reason the World Health Organization and many others have come to the conclusion that individual education or behavior change starting at pre-K all the way through high school may not be enough to change a social practice. Most researchers conclude that social expectations have to change as well. And looking at a development through a focus on norms helps identify barriers and motivations for change at the community and societal levels. But once we know where and what those barriers are, what can we do? Well, this isn't the first, this isn't the first thing we're going to talk about, but this is the First thing we can do in the first gender revolutionary thing I'm going to mention. You can break the binary by considering more than just two options when it comes to gender norms and roles and gender equality. Queer theory and gender studies scholars like Dr. Judith Butler have developed theories which su suggest that gender is fluid, flexible, and subject to change. Dr. Butler's work is key to this understanding. She argues that gender is performative, meaning that the performance of gender is what makes gender exist. And if you don't understand, stick with me. And many researchers and theorists agree with her. What we know from gender research is that people bring gender into being through gender acts. These acts are not necessarily deliberate or consciously chosen but are the repetitive practices that perpetually reproduce gender. For example, wearing makeup, trousers or skirts, or calling people he or she. Dr. Butler suggests that gender doesn't come from a rooted identity somewhere inside of us, but that it only exists through our actions and the actions of other in society towards us. Butler and other researchers agree that gender reality is performative, 
which sounds technical, but just means quite simply that it is real only to the extent that it is performed. Meaning a woman is a woman in the US and a woman is a woman in Russia, but they may not be or have the same type of norms or be or have the same types of ex expectations. And Butler, Butler made it really clear that this could be thought of as doing gender rather than being a gender. And I'd like to ask you to think of doing gender is the interactional process, meaning from me to you and you to me, of crafting gender identities, whatever they are, that are then presumed to reflect and naturally derive from biology. Like men pee standing up more regularly, so only men pee standing up or should pee standing up. And I'm here to tell you that one's not true. Or how about women wear dresses more than men wear dresses? So only women wear dresses or should wear dresses. And I'm also here to tell you that one's not true either. So if gender is performed in relation to gender norms, either in line with them or transgressing them or somewhere in between, the relationship to a gender norm is what makes the person intelligible or understood. Either, either they're a conformer or a transgressor. I'll let you decide which one of those I am. So I'm going to ask you to reject the idea of a stable gender identity and at least for tonight, consider that the doing and the performance of gender is what constitutes the identity of a given person. I'm going to ask you to think of gender as not a real thing, but purely the social construction that it is. I want you to believe if only for a night the gender identity and gender differences are beliefs compelled and supported by social actions. I'm asking you to do this because if the idea that gender is a social construction, that means that gender norms can shift and are open to contestation and would accept the multitude of diversity and variety that currently exists and is not tied to material bodily facts or the sex of an individual. A key part of gender equality for many gender equality advocates, and in my opinion too, is delinking gender, sex, and sexuality by showing that these elements don't have a linear relationship to one another based on biology. Maybe the example easiest to understand is trans people who are living a gender different from the one they were assigned at birth, this disrupts the expectation that gender comes from biology. And for some people in our culture, we all know that's a no-go for them. Another example would be a group of lesbian sex workers in Bangladesh who perform transactional heterosexual sex, but express a desire to be partnered and intimate with someone who shares their same sexuality. Because they have heterosexual sex for money doesn't mean that they are any less of anything they identify as, and that certainly doesn't mean they're straight. So in an extremely condensed version, I'm gonna take you through it, we're going to pick it apart, and then we're gonna put it back together. But this is gonna require most of you to forget everything you've ever learned about gender. And I'm gonna take a drink real quick. So here's another gender revolutionary ask. I'm about to ask everyone to look at the term sex as simply the marker recorded on their birth certificate. The World Health Organization points out that the term sex is the biological difference that distinguishes people as manifested by a combination of anatomical, in other words, our internal reproductive organs and our genitals, our genetic, and hormonal distinctions, as well as, a, as other sexual characteristics. But there's always a problem, and this term is problematic, when used to essentialize sex as the totality of one's sexuality or gender identity. 
For instance, intersex persons or individuals whose sexual autonomy or anatomy rather doesn't conform with convention or society's norms, they're often exposed to stigma, forced surgery, and other human rights abuses. Also, and as most of you probably would be quick to point out, not everyone's gender identity always conforms to their genitalia. That's why many of us prefer to use the term assigned sex to contextualize that in many instances, one sex is often imposed by a society on an individual and rarely does that mold get broken. But hey, that's why we're here and that's why we call it a revolution. We're gonna break some molds. So we've talked about the boxes our cultures puts us in from birth and we've surmised that closets, they exist because some of us feel forced to hide who we are if we don't fit into whatever mold was prepared for us. Now let's talk about what happens if and when we don't conform to the social norms and gender norms that our culture values. Anytime that happens, that's contextualized as gender nonconforming. And it's a term used when describing people that don't conform to those social norms and gender norms we spoke about earlier. In many American cultures, all of these would be gender nonconforming behavior. A man might show emotion and tenderness and God forbid cry in front of another man or his children. A woman might wear a suit on her wedding day instead of a dress. A man might wear eyeliner. A woman might pursue a career instead of marriage and motherhood. A man might shave his legs and under his armpits, maybe even his pubic hair. A woman might be assertive. A man might stay at home and watch his children. Now think about what happens if we introduce something really radical and think about people that really break the social norms and fall in love and enter into intimate partnerships with people of the same sex as themselves. Even more radical, think about not really identifying with any gender and considering yourself non-binary like me, whoa. And maybe even the most radical, think about what's happening in our country and around the world. Think about what it would be like to not have your gender identity align with your anatomy. Think about what it would be, what it would take in order for you to feel safe and secure enough to identify as who you truly are. Whoa, pump the brakes. What does it all mean? How can we stop the madness? Is it too late? Are we all doomed to a life of gender inequality? Nope, <laughs> simply no. Well, not if we remember these concepts. We would be so much better off if we could all realize that sexual orientation just refers to romantic and or sexual attraction to men, women, both, or neither. And that anyone can be attracted to people of the opposite gender, heterosexual, to people of the same gender, homosexual, gay from male to male or lesbian to female to female, or to both genders, bisexual. One can also be asexual, no sexual attraction to anyone, or pansexual, sexual or a romantic attraction that's not limited to any particular sex or gender identity. There are many definitions that people use to describe their sexual orientation and all are valid because sexual orientation is individualistic and unique to any given person. Love is love, or so I've heard. I'm sorry, another drink. So we're not doomed if we can understand that our gender identity isn't determined by our assigned sex. While the common assumption is that our assigned sex and our gender identity are the same, male equals boy, man, female equals girl, woman, sex and gender are two distinct categories. Sex is the body or the container, while gender is the content or matter that fills the container. A person whose lived experiences don't match their assigned sex assigned at birth they're known as a transgender person or gender diverse person. A person whose assigned sex is male and identifies as a woman is a woman, a transgender woman, or a trans woman. A person assigned sex is, is female 
and identifies as a man is simply a man, transgender man, or trans man. A person who gender, whose gender identity matches his or her assigned sex is considered cisgendered, and my dad has a big problem with this word. Um, and while a person who relates to neither, all, or a combination of genders, they're known as gender fluid, gender queer, or, or other terms. We will see gender equality when we can all realize that our gender expression is influenced by our assigned sex, our sexual orientation, and or gender identity, and it may or may not reflect a society's expectations. And when we, and when we respect that differences are what makes it so wonderful to be a human. So if sex is the container and gender is the content, Gender expression is the container's decorations, if you will. Although some containers may be forced to look alike, I can assure you what fills the container is something completely, completely unique and diverse. It's the difference between saying and thinking this. And saying and thinking this. Remember that in order for gender equality to be successful for everyone, but especially LGBT people, we need to keep the following concepts separated. We'll need to remember to separate sexual orientation, gender identity, sex, gender expression, and sexuality. We'll need to remember that all of these SOGI terms are relative and unique to each individual and that no two people will or is required to have exactly the same SOGI as everyone else. We will also need to remember not to group others into molds that fit us. But maybe, and because we're talking about the LGBT community right now, the one I've really mentioned and we'll circle back to now is that we'll need to remember to include sexual orientation in our conversations about equality and equity. Remember that our polling places, our doctor's offices, our school systems, anywhere that gender is a prevalent concern and people experience sex gender discrimination, we'll need to be on guard. We'll need to adopt gender norms as the confused child of social norms and that sexual orientation is the third generation in an already confused, inbred, and socially constructed family. But all kidding aside though, in order to be an advocate for change, we'll need to remember to broaden, broaden our own views on the fight for gender equality, lean into some of our own discomfort, and dial into what gender equality really means. And keep in mind that we're talking about more than just women's rights. Because you never know when you may be called to on to become an ally or an advocate and forced to stand up, speak out, and get people thinking differently. When confronted by sex, sex discrimination, it's important to consider the rights we currently have and the rights we're still fighting for. As an advocate for gender equality, it's important to realize that sometimes laws change before people's attitudes and certainly their beliefs and that laws are the only tools in many cases, in most cases, that LGBTQ people have to ensure they're treated equitably and equally and are often required before social norms can change. Let's say it's Saturday afternoon and I wanted to walk down my street in a dress. In this state, some might not think it odd or some may think it odd, but look the other way. In other U.S. states, I may be taunted and ridiculed, but I ultimately have the right to do that. The laws in place say that, more or less. In other countries, I could be jailed, accosted, or even killed. And the actions of those responsible, condoned by society at large, based on their beliefs surrounding gender and gender roles. 
The laws that govern a particular society and whether or not their laws include rights and protections of LGBT people are largely responsible for where that country sits on the gender inequality index we talked about earlier. The idea that sexual orientation inequality and sex gender are related is by no means a new one. It dates back to at least the late 1960s and early 1970s when radical feminists addressed the issue of lesbianism as an integral part of women's liberation. Homosexuality was at that time beginning to be removed as a psychological inadequacy by our medical communities and Stonewall was right around the corner. Many LGBT rights activists at the time came to similar conclusions and over the years, psychologists have conducted numerous studies documenting the correlation between attitudes about gender roles and attitudes about homosexuality. Even anti-gay, anti-feminist, right-wing conservatives continue to make the connection. In response, several legal scholars adopted these ideas and applied them by arguing that sexual orientation discrimination should be attacked legally by revealing it as sex gender discrimination. In the US, most of the laws that ensure equality and equity for LGBT people free of sex gender discrimination piggyback other laws that were currently in effect and are written under the context of sex discrimination and many laws have been amended over the years to clarify or define what sex discrimination is or is not. Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 prohibited sex discrimination in employment initially and was later amended to include employment discrimination on the basis of sex and then amended again to include sexual orientation and gender identity. The Fair Housing Act and HUD Equal Access Rule prohibits housing discrimination on the basis of race, color, national origin, religion, sex, familial status, and disability. And Title IX bans discrimination based on sex and reads, no person in the United States shall, on the basis of sex, be excluded from participation in, be denied the benefits of, or be subject to discrimination under any educational program or activity receiving federal financial assistance. Ultimately, our laws that prohibit sex discrimination were up until recently, largely left up to individual states and district municipality to define what sex discrimination meant and who it was protecting. How those protections are applied to the law in their states, how they were interpreted, and how they're adjudicated. Seemingly and in reality, an LGBT person might have protections in some states, but not in others. Up until recently, that is. We'll take a moment here. Um, as maybe some of you know, at the heart of a story now playing out in schools, workplaces and, or workplaces and courts across the U.S. is a disagreement over legal meaning of the word sex and whether discrimination against gay and transgender people for being gay or transgender is considered sex discrimination. The White House has a particular kind of power over this question. It has the power to interpret whether LGBTQ people are protected by sex discrimination protections and laws passed by our Congress to issue rules and policies that reflect interpretation and through those actions, the power to send a message to our country. And in the last several years, two White House administrations have used this power diametrically opposite ways. Um, some of us LGBTQ activists and our allies say it, says it feels kind of like civil rights whiplash. Take for instance, Title IX and the Obama administration's guidance to schools on gender nonconforming, LGB, and transgender students that came out in the spring of 2016. It required schools to protect gender nonconforming, LGB, 
and transgender students from harassment, bullying, accommodate their preferred names and pronouns, add specific areas of LGBT education, including sex education, and give them access to the locker rooms and bathrooms of their choice. The turnabout from the Trump administration came quickly in February of 2017, just a few weeks after President Trump's inauguration. His administration rescinded the Obama gender nonconforming and transgender student guidance. Weeks after that, because of the reversal, the Supreme Court took a transgender plaintiff's case off its calendar and reframed their rulings on several other pending gender equality cases. Trump's reversal of Obama's gender nonconforming and transgender student guidance was just the first warning shot, for our community anyway, and that the courtship of the LGBTQ voters ended with their campaign. And as president, Trump planned to move aggressively to roll back LGBTQ protections, which he did consistent, consistently throughout his presidency, 181 times, right up until President Biden was inaugurated. The Biden administration have been dutifully rolling back some of the Trump administration anti-LGBT actions and are in stark contrast to the 181 plus negative policies that and rhetoric deployed against LGBTQ Americans by our previous administration. And I won't read you the list of 181 injustices, but I will say that chief among those, the Trump White House fought to allow workplaces to terminate queer and trans employees based on their identities, roll back protections for trans students and homeless people seeking shelter, and ban most transgender troops and people living with HIV from serving in our military. In contrast, President Biden signed an executive order on his first day instructing all federal departments to apply the Supreme Court's 2020 ruling, which found that civil rights laws and employment apply to LGBTQ workers. Biden's order served to extend protections on the basis of sex sexual orientation and gender identity in settings like public housing and healthcare facilities that receive federal funding. Days later, Biden repealed Trump's trans military ban and signed a memo committing to advancing LGBTQ rights in all foreign policy decisions. More recently, President Biden and Vi Vice President Harris announced that their administration is forming an LGBTQ Inclusive Gender Policy Council intended to increase the full participation of all people, including women and girls across all aspects of our society. According to the White House, the initiative's goals include decreasing poverty, furthering education access, and improving the health outcomes of vulnerable groups. The Biden-Harris administration rolled this out on International Women's Day, and the council's formation was lauded by us anyway as a way forward. But as we've discussed this week, our country still has a lot of work to do before we can achieve gender equality. A lot of minds to change, a lot of rules and norms to reform. How can you become a part of the gender revolution, you ask? Generally, this is where day one of the SOGI training would end and we would cover this during our second meeting. But Melina has offered to help me address some of the most common issues and methods of supporting gender equality. And she's going to model some of the best practices when trying to speak up for LGBT people's rights and to debunk harmful stereotypes. And this is really what will stop the madness. So Melina, we both know that language matters. It's through language that we define ourselves and explain the world around us. And as you and I know, it's also how we define and put down others, not just through name calling and threats, but by appropriating a word many use to describe identity and contorting it into a derogatory insult. 
In seven years, the Special Olympics, they spread the word to end the word campaign. They've garnered more than 500,000 pledges from people to stop saying retarded as an insult to people with intellectual and developmental disabilities anyway. Their persistence has led to a cultural change. Some TV networks now bleep the word just like any other curse word. Many folks still call LGBT people fags or describe something they find stupid or distasteful as gay. Lots of these people probably don't consider themselves homophobic, but every time friends, family, and neighbors stay silent, it empowers those who are and diminishes and harms LGBT. LGBT people. Even gentle reminders that gay isn't an insult or that saying fag is unacceptable help make inclusion and thoughtfulness the default rather than derision and hate. Um, what can people say or do when they hear anti-LGBT gender discriminatory slurs, Melina? Uh, can you repeat the question, please? Yeah, what, what can people say or do when they hear other people using anti-LGBTQ or gender discriminatory slurs? Like, like that's so gay. I think this, the most simple thing to do is just to educate the person you hear saying it, even if it feels uncomfortable. I mean, I feel like we've gotten to a point, especially now that it's 2021, that honestly, fuck politeness, fuck being, like, uncomfortable, like, it, this can't slide anymore, so just saying, like, just simply educating someone, like, honestly, at this point, they should know better, but if they don't, explain why it's wrong, explain why you shouldn't be using that word in that way, or using those slurs, and how it affects you, and a lot of, not even just you individually, but in general, how it affects the community, and if they consider themselves an ally, and not homophobic, sexist, racist, et cetera, and they should be able to get behind that and learn from it. Yeah, well said. I, I'm telling you, <laughs> I wish more people, uh, more people could be like you, Melina. Um, oh, <laughs> so as advocates, you know, we realize that LGBT people still face very real dangers for openly displaying their sexual orientation or even coming out in the first place. Um, while overall violence against our community as a whole is lessened, murders were up and violence against transgender people has risen alarmingly. Um, we know that it's particularly hard for LGBT youth and many of whom say they don't live in a community that accept them. Um, how can our communities, in your opinion, how can our communities help create and protect safe spaces for LGBTQ people to be themselves? Well, I think first of all, that all spaces need to, even need to be inclusive of everyone in the community or just not exist at all. Like for example, um, I know of COVID, it's a little iffy on like clubs, bars, that kind of thing. Um, but also another thing is just like, there's so much exclusionary behavior in the community whether it be uh, racism, um, oh, are you okay? Yeah, I'm sorry. That's my cup. Uh, I'm so sorry. Oh, if, <laughs> uh, whether it be racism, whether it be against trans people, biphobia, all kinds of it. I think the best way, obviously, it's, it's not going to just be completely like ended overnight, but I think the best way is to kind of like educate each other and when you see that kind of behavior, educate people in the community and try to explain how that can hurt the community as a whole and how the community is not going to stay together if these things keep happening. Like we're supposed to be a community, not fighting each other. So I think just trying to have as much inclusion and not kind of be in like one click or one side, if that makes sense. Yeah, and try makes sense. just like hear from other people's perspectives and sides and meet new people. That makes perfect sense, actually. Uh, like simply being visible and vocal in support of LGBT people's safety can go a long way, you know, just right. saying what you said right now could go a long way. And, you know, organizations, including Human Rights Campaign and GLSEN, they have guides about how to create safe zones for students and youth. So 
the information's out there and God knows uh, I will volunteer any day of the week to help make a safe space. So we discussed how changing No, we're going to go back. You know, it's important for allies to show support, as you said, right. uh, because sometimes they're over-enthusiastic support. You know, it can drown out and diminish the people they're, they're fighting for so vehemently. You know, um, a lot of well-meaning people drown out some of those people and their lived experiences. And ending discrimination requires elevating oppressed people. And we've learned that through Black Lives Matter. We've learned that through hashtag me too. We've learned that throughout history. And providing a platform for folks whose voices and options are marginalized. It's important that LGBT people tell their stories and share their thoughts and set the agenda. And I know you've already mentioned a few, but what are some of the ways advocates and allies like you and I can help raise up LGBT voices so they can advocate for themselves. I think one of the biggest things is amplifying voices rather than trying to speak for, speak over people. So even though we are both in the community, there are some experiences we will never really truly understand. Like for example, um, the murder, of, the murders of trans black women has been on the rise for a long time now and continuously is. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the best way to try and get like raise awareness for that instead of trying to speak for that community is let that community have a voice and try to amplify it rather than speak over um and that's not the only example there are other situations where those kind of issues need to be amplified but i think that that's pro not probably i think that would be the best way to do it rather than try to speak of experiences we haven't lived ourselves but we could also speak of experiences we've lived ourselves to try and like empathize um, and add support, but also not speak over. Melina, I'm going to put you on a holiday card list and I don't even send holiday cards. That's <laughs> lovely. That is lovely. <laughs> Thank lovely. you. Um, so we discussed how changing culture isn't enough. And despite the fact that three years ago, 88% of people and 86% of Republicans supported the view that your sexual orientation shouldn't impede your right to earn a living, and just recently, only 28 states had explicit non-discrimination policies in place. Polls and surveys showed, I guess, that six in 10 people nationally, I think, believe transgender people should be able to use the bathroom that corresponds with their identity. But that didn't stop North Carolina from passing a controversial law that both criminalizes that and explicitly excludes sexual orientation from the state's non-discrimination law. Um, despite in-state polling that shows a majority of North Carolinians want non-discrimination protections based on sexual orientation, and more than 100 corporations voicing their opposition to the law, the governor just stuck to his guns. What are some of the ways, Melina, that our allies and fellow advocates can advocate for legal change? So there are, especially something I've learned more about that I didn't really realize is there's a lot of ways to um, contact people in the government, state legislature, et cetera, whether it be phone call, email, letters. I learned that more um, during the Black Lives Matter movement. There's a lot of petitions that were going around in different ways you can contact um, your government officials, um, whether there were different issues you wanted to bring to their attention and try to advocate for. And the same can be said for different issues in the LGBTQ plus community. So whether it's a, a certain law we wanna get passed or there's a variety of issues that will come up and continue to come up. Um, I think that just educating more, educating yourself more on which government officials are responsible for whatever issue is going on and just trying to contact them. Um, it might sound intimidating, but there are some really easy like um, scripts you can use, whether you, um, scripts you can use for phone calls, uh, emails, etc. So I think just trying to become more proactive with that. 
Yeah, I'm going to throw in there too that you should join organizations like the Kyle Highland Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, Solano Pride, that advocate for our community. Um, and we are already involved in those systems and we can help you direct your venom towards the uh, intended recipient. <laughs> hint, hint, hint. Um, <laughs> so, being a part of, of our community and having these types of conversations with people doesn't mean that we're looking to bring others on board our gay crews. However, I have on more than one occasion been accused of recruiting youth into the LGBT community by respecting and, and using the preferred pronouns. I always think that if a member of the LGBT community is trying to educate you or anyone on some of these stereotypes, it's only because knowledge helps decrease the hatred and ignorance. It's not because they relish the opportunity. So I assume by introducing myself with my preferred pronouns that that helps people manage expectations on how to address me, but also lets them know that I feel a certain way about gender identity, that people can't, some people can't understand the new trend of adding pronouns and emails to introductions. How do you feel about pronouns? Are they important? If so, why? If not, why? Pronouns are definitely important. And here's like the thing that I just want to like bring up first is everyone has pronouns. And I think the people that get so up in arms about it and act like it's weird and like some kind of weird trend, you have pronouns. Like I think people forget that they have pronouns. And when people get so offended when they're asked their pronouns, they'll be like, I'm a girl. Can you not see I'm a girl? Like, why are you asking my pronouns? Like, calm down, chill. The actual reason, not you, but I mean like these people that get so like upset about it. Right. like calm down and listen the reason that pronouns are being asked is because like you said we shouldn't just assume someone's gender identity because they might go by they and them pronouns they might go by she they he they etc so by normalizing it and just asking everyone their pronouns those people don't feel isolated and they don't feel called out as well as avoiding um prejudice or anything like that and may also making them feel more safe so that's why it's also important, like on social media, to have and all, like social media to have your um, pronouns present as well as like int email introductions, etc. It just makes it more normalized for everyone. Um, yeah, and I also feel like this is more like a personal thing, but for me, gender feel like I just don't really like. I'm fine if people use she pronouns for me. Like I am a woman. However, I also like they and them pronouns because I don't feel like gender really matters. Like for me personally, like I just don't like that so many like basic things are gendered. Like it just makes me uncomfortable. I like having gender neutral terms. Like, I just, I don't know. I feel like it makes things simpler. So that's why I personally like it. And yeah, that's why I feel like it is really important. Everyone has different perspectives on gender and how it affects them. So that's why I feel like it's really important. I agree, and I think that English teachers all over this country have always, always, always had a problem with them, they, uh, for some reason, but... Yeah, and you, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, you go ahead. I was going to say, I have dealt with several adults in my life that also feel the same way, and here's how I like to tell them, like, why it's really not an issue. So let's say, like, you have, like, a male person drop off a package, right? You don't know if they're a man or a woman. So you're going to use they to, to refer to them because you don't know their gender. It's the same thing. It's not a big deal. People make it a big deal and it doesn't have to be. Also, it avoids misgendering someone. Like you're not going to, because you don't know the gender of someone because you haven't even seen them, you're going to use the, the pronoun they. Same thing even if you know the person so you don't misgender them. Yeah, for me, that's kind of like the same thing if a person walks up to say someone that looks like they're pregnant and isn't and says, oh, congratulations, when's your baby due? Exactly. Yeah, it's that social faux pas that we don't really mean to create, but it, it happens. Those microaggressions, except that one's really macro. Uh, 
Woo! That one will get yeah. you in trouble and beat up <laughs> and beat up. So I threw up um, break the binary and challenge the gender systems you see if they're discriminatory, regardless if you yourself are being affected. Every person has a voice when it comes to gender equality. Am I right? Yes. Oh, good. Do you want to add on to that one? <laughs> I, what I, I think a lot of people can be allies and can also help with that um, gender equality. What was the last thing you used? Like revolution or? Yeah, our gender revolution because we're yeah. revolting. When I see a lot of cisgendered people have their pronouns present, it makes me happy because it means that they want to add on to the solution and right. they don't want to have people, other people feel isolated and also avoid misgendering. So I think it's a really important thing. And even if you are cis and straight, it doesn't mean you can't still show your support and solidarity and it just makes it more inclusive altogether. Yeah, you know what? Um... It's not by coincidence that I probably have more cis and straight friends uh, than I do actual LGBTQ friends. And that's weird for me to say because I work at an LGBTQ um, facility, but that is the reality of my life. I you know, was in the military for 20 years and I made a lot of family and a lot of those people, they don't give a crap about who you are, what you wear, or what you do on your free time, you know, and, and we're just family. And I don't want to speak for you, but I think that we're both aligned in the belief that ending discrimination won't happen overnight. Right, absolutely. Right? But if we all take small steps every day to raise LGBT equality and beat back hate, vitriol, and prejudice, then we can build on the winds of 2021 and move closer to true inclusiveness and tolerance. What do you think? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. All right, then. And that, my informed allies, concludes tonight's indoctrination into the gender revolution. You can pick your rainbows and glitter up at the door. But before you go, <laughs> I'm going to go ahead and assign you all some homework. And the next time we see each other, we can have a chat. Don't worry, it won't hurt. It's not math. I'm going to ask each of you to pay attention to how often gender norms play a part in your everyday life. I'm going to ask you to look at it from an anthropological and sociological perspective and really dig into yourself and your environments, each societal system you're involved in, home, school, work, community, spiritual spaces. Look at the things around you, the colors and styles of clothes you and others around you wear, your bathroom routines and the items you buy, your social media content and what you post and like, your speech and others. How many times do you hear people being gendered? How many times do you gender people? What are the things you like to watch on television? Why do you like to watch them? What music do you listen to? What vehicles do you drive? What colors do you like? And which ones don't you like? Do gender norms show up everywhere you look? Do gender norms play a part in your everyday life? Do gender norms not show up at all? Now, the real question we should be asking is, do you believe what you believe and like what you like because you believe it and you like it? Or do you believe what you think you're supposed to believe and like what you think you're supposed to like based on whatever gender you identify with? So until we meet again, should you have questions, concerns, or need additional information, clarification, want to get involved, want to meet other LGBT youth and allies and get all this, please don't hesitate to contact Solano Pride, the Kyle Highland Foundation, or Benicia Teen Center. If you're an LGBTQ youth from zero to 25 years of age and find yourself without community, I would like to invite you personally any time to contact me directly so we can remedy that. Life is far too short and oftentimes too scary to think that you're not, that you're out there all alone. You know, we're everywhere, we're everyone, and we're here for you. 
you matter. And that's it. Thanks for joining us. And Barb, I think you're muted, but trying to talk. I do that every time. Anyway, I was going to say thank you so much, Jamie and Melina, for uh, being here tonight and presenting on this very important topic. I was very fascinating. I learned a lot tonight. And so I really appreciate your being here and taking the time um, to share all of this valuable information because we just, we want to be more welcoming. We want to be able to advocate for the LGBTQ plus community. And these presentations are so valuable um, because we can just share that information with so many people. I appreciate that. Uh, I, I thank you for allowing me to share it. In fact, I I think we should probably start talking about some other social constructions we have and, and start delinking some of that nonsense. Um, the more I think community talk about this, it's like ripples in the pond and I throw a rock in and all of a sudden everyone's wet. Yeah. So I'm hoping through our campaign this week that people have taken the time to at least lean into some discomfort and why do I believe what I believe? And can I stand up for myself? And if I can't, who, who could? You know, and thank goodness the Kyle Highland Foundation is out there in Benicia. And thank goodness that we're, we're having these campaigns and it's getting people's attention because there are a lot of people, in my opinion, and probably not just my opinion, but a lot of people need to hear other people that are at least a little bit like them or LGBT or allies in order to just survive. You know, it's, it's, it's hard when you feel like you're alone and the, the fact that they're, people are never alone, well, that doesn't hit you until you realize it. 